Hi everyone and welcome to my video on infection control. This is a very fundamental topic that you're going to learn probably in the beginning of your nursing school courses and I think it's very important not only because NCLEX could potentially um, test on it but it's also important for you to know because as a nurse you're going to be working with people who have a lot of different diseases maybe short term or long term you don't know but you want to make sure that you are protecting yourselves and your loved ones that you're coming home to and even your other patients you know you don't want to cross contaminate things from room to room so this is something to really make sure you have an understanding of um, some things that we're going to talk about are the chain of infection, means of transmission, different types of personal protective equipment, and standard precautions. So we're going to get a little good overview of everything. So let's get started. First off, this is our chain of infection. So I'm going to go through and talk about each of these different components, but I just wanted to show you it in its entirety just because our main goal at any time is to try to break the chain of infection. No matter where it may be, we want to make sure that we get in there and try to break the chain. So that is the biggest thing about this entire thing. So let's get started into more in-depth of this chain. An infectious agent. So I like to think of this as the bad guy. You know, it's the bacteria or the virus or the fungus that's going to get you sick or make you feel funny. So that's the infectious agent. The reservoir. A reservoir is literally a holding tank, so that's what I like to think of it as. Um, it could be a human, so it could be you, it could be an animal. Even food, water, or soil could be a reservoir. So it's basically whatever the bad guy is going to want to get into. From there, the bad guy, he's going to want to escape. So he's going to have some type of portal of exit. So that's a means for leaving. It's either going to be maybe the respiratory tract, the skin, or some type of mucous membrane. And how he's going to leave, that's the mode of transmission. So there's four different types of modes of transmissions, and we're going to talk about them more in depth. But just to let you know, they're contact, droplet, airborne, and vectorborne. So those are the types of ways that your germ or your virus is going to get out. And then it needs a portal of entry. It needs somewhere to go. And that's the same thing as the portal of exit. It could be the respiratory tract or your skin or some type of mucous membrane. And then once it enters, it needs to make sure you're susceptible. So my biggest example for a susceptible host would be a nursing student. You know, a susceptible host is somebody that has a compromised defense mechanism. So a little bit on the weaker side. So nursing students are perfect. You know, we're tired. We probably are not eating or drinking adequately, and we're really stressed out. So those are some factors that really make us susceptible, you know, to these infectious agents. So the modes of transmissions, I said we would talk about those a little bit more. Like I said, there's these four types, and we really don't talk about vector-borne too much, but I still wanted to let you know what it is just in case it were to pop up in one of your classes. So contact. That could be direct contact, indirect contact, or fecal-oral contact. So for di direct contact, that's something physical. You know, you shake somebody's hand, and then you touch your eye, but maybe they just sneezed into their hand. So you touch something of theirs, and then you touched yourself. Indirect contact, um, that's more with an inanimate object. So maybe you touched a bathroom stall doorknob, and somebody didn't wash their hands coming out of the bathroom. Um, and then you touched your mouth or something, and that so that would be indirect contact. And then fecal oral contact, my biggest example with that would be pink eye. So droplet, um, it kind of sounds like what it is. Um, it they they're little germs that you know drop in the air. So that's sneezing, coughing, and talking. And then airborne. Um, that's a lot like droplet. Sometimes they're really easy to get confused. But airborne, they stay in the air a little bit. You know, they're literally airborne. Um, so that's sneezing and coughing. And then vectorborne, those are things like animals and insects that hold um, that hold these infectious agents. So my biggest example here would be Lyme disease. That So ticks. And so you're probably asking, you know, what do I wear to prevent these things. 
and that is personal protective equipment, or you might see it as PPE. And some examples of that would be, we have these little shoe covers here. We have gloves, always glove up. Gowns, this is this yellow thing. This hair mask, you know, you might get it. You might see it um, before you have surgery. Sometimes they put that on you. And then you have a mask right here. And there's different types of masks, um, but this is just a basic one. And although we're going to get into greater detail of specific, like, times when you know you're going to need to wear these, I had no idea when I would even know um, if a patient required me to wear these. So when I went into the hospital... I was able to see, and so through my experience, every hospital might be different, but through my experience, you had, this is the back of the patient's door, and then this is the wall, you know, and then this was walking into their room. So on the wall right here, maybe it's their room number, and then right underneath their room number was some type of alert sign some something very simple that stated, hey, you know, you need to wear this personal protective equipment. And right on the back of the door was a huge box that had little boxes containing all of this stuff. So you always had anything that you needed literally right, right here. It was right there for you. And they kind of have to make it simple like that because you're not the only person going into your patient's room. You know, you have visitors coming in. You have physical therapy, speech therapy. Even some people from the cafeteria are going to be coming in. And everybody needs to make sure that they're protecting themselves. So they're not going to make it too difficult. But one of the biggest things is make sure you check whatever warning sign might be on the outside of their door because you want to make sure that you wear the right uh, protective equipment. Now, in greater detail, we have two different types of precautions. Um, we have a standard precaution, and we have a transmission-based precaution. And the biggest thing for me to remember is that st standard precautions have two words in them. So there's two components. There's two reasons why you would need standard precautions. And for transmission-based precautions, there's three words. So there's three different um, times that you would need to imply transmission-based precautions. So for standard precautions, this is blood and bodily fluids. So those are the two components in a standard precaution. Anytime you're dealing with blood or some type of bodily fluid, whether that be, you know, mucus or urine, you're going to want to make sure you wear gloves. Gloves are always with standard precautions. They're always with transmission-based precautions. And I would say as an overall, I always glove up. You know, you never know what you're going to get into when you get into a patient's room. Unless you know you're just going to talk to them, I would highly suggest wearing gloves at all times. For transmissions-based precautions, these are our airborne droplet and contact. Vectorborne really isn't a thing here, um, but our main ones are airborne droplet and contact. So personal protection protective equipment for each of the precautions. For standard, like I said, it's mainly gloves. You know, you always are going to want to wear gloves when you're dealing with blood or um, urine or something like that. You don't want to mix your, if you have a cut on your finger, you don't want to get somebody else's blood inside of that cut. For transmission-based precautions, I'm going to go into detail with the three specific ones, but overall, you're going to need masks, gowns, and like I said, always gloves. Here and there, you're probably going to need your shoe and your hairnet, um, as I pictured, but that's more of a specific time-to-time um, -time type thing. So for airborne, you're going to need a mask. For droplet, you're going to need a mask. And for contact, you're going to need a gown. And you're going to need gloves with all of these things as well. And for a lot of these people, almost all of them, they're going to be in a private room. And they're, if they're not in a private room, they're in a room with somebody who has the same precautions as them. So just try to take that into account as well. And any, it's not just you who needs to, you know, gear up. Any visitor coming in, um, they need to wear the same exact thing that you are. We want to try to make sure that we're always protecting anybody that goes into the room. And so that's everything on infection control. I hope.
this video really helped you guys out. And please, please, please don't forget to subscribe. Um, I have a lot of other videos coming, and I'm really, really excited for you guys. All right. Thanks.